All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. No, that's not George, that's not Jeff, that's Terry on the other side. This is episode 854, and today's date is May 3rd, 2024. All right, on the other side of my webcam, way in, in front of his computer, right, you're in Tennessee right now? East Tennessee, in the East mountains Tennessee. of East Tennessee. I have Terry Maddenly, a uh, person I've known for many years. Uh, it was actually a, a, a um, he was a client of mine when we ran a Get Religion on our web servers for a little while. Yeah. So we, we have to be honest about our relationship up front. Uh, but in a such, uh, I've been reading Get Religion. I've been following you on your uh, syndicated uh, news column for many years. And you have followed religion for a long time. It'd be great to talk about uh, exactly how the news has changed. And I'm talking about the, mm -hmm. the, the media itself has changed over time in its respect to covering religion. And uh, specifically, I hope we can cover Anglicanism a little bit. But how are you doing today, Terry? Doing pretty good. Uh, nearing the end of Holy Week uh, in the Orthodox calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, Passover is in the rearview mirror. And I think we have about another 14 hours of worship to go before we get to Pascha uh, at about 1 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. Like many people in my audience, you have changed denominations a couple times. You started out, if I remember yeah. correctly, a Southern Baptist. You spent a, a, a little bit of time in the Episcopal Church, and you're uh, currently in the Orthodox Church. I was an Episcopalian for a decade, mm -hmm. um, and that included, I guess the, the major period of time would have been in Colorado, which, if you know your Anglican history, you know that if you were in Colorado in the 1980s and early 90s, sure. you you watched the Anglican warfare mm -hmm. at some of its most basic levels. And I covered it as a reporter. And um, the local bishop for most of that time was the late Bishop William C. Fry, mm -hmm. who was an interesting and complex man, uh, a leader in the charismatic renewal movement, but whose churchmanship was in many ways Anglo-Catholic. Um, but he was actually a candidate for presiding bishop while he was in Colorado. I think a lot of people forget that, which meant the entire presiding bishop trail came through Colorado there for a while. And I have one funny anecdote to share from that. But yes, I, my wife and I have, uh, have been Orthodox now for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, so... You started, I think, in the uh, mid '80s as a journalist. Um, you got went to journalism school, and uh, I read somewhere you actually got to follow Bono and the Boys for a little while. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I was a I was a rock columnist in Champaign Urbana, Illinois, uh, in the late '70s and early '80s, mm -hmm. and an obscure Irish band rolled into town in a white panel truck in, in the in 81 mm -hmm. or was it early 82 it was right right about the first year but anyway. i saw them in madison in 1982 at headliners um in uh -huh. their, uh, their first was it wasn't war it was uh um the album before that uh tour no it's october october that was it was yeah. it was the the album that was mm -hmm. heavily influenced by the death of bono's mother mm -hmm. and famously they lost he lost his notebook mm -hmm. which bus. contained all of the lyrics for the album and they only had like five or six days to record it before they were under contract to get out of town on tour and so as he told me in kind of a a charismatic fit he just stood at the mic and improvised most of the lyrics and thus a lot more christianity ended up in those lyrics than the record company wanted sure. shall we put it that way yeah. and so i spotted that and got an interview with him before they arrived in town and then spent several hours with them i heard them in sound check and in my notes they i think they were writing sunday bloody sunday uh during the sound check they were working mm -hmm. on tunes for the next album 
and they had fragments of that song already ready. I went to their Bible study after the concert and left them at about three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was an interesting encounter. I tried to write an article about it for Rolling Stone, and they thought I made it up. I mean, they couldn't really. So, um, but still, I'm in the encyclopedia of U2 studies uh, as the person who did the first interview with them about their faith. Oh, wow. In the, in the mainstream press. Oh, great. So let's talk Anglicanism. Um, th- I think the biggest problem we've discovered is the media is impatient with what happens in a denomination, whether it be Methodist, Episcopalians, Anglicans, the Roman Catholics. Uh, mm-hmm. They need news to be now, and they, they, they don't care who wins, good guy or bad guy, but uh, when stories take 20 years to unfold, uh, your profession doesn't care. 20 years. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, I, I'm being generous, of course. That's cutting it quite short. Yeah. Just a moment. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think what... At Get Religion, which lasted for 20 years, we closed on February 2nd on our 20th anniversary and published approximately 15 million words of commentary. And at Get Religion we had a trope that we called Anglican timeline disease. And what percentage of coverage of Anglicanism in the mainstream press have you seen that says it started with the ordination of a gay bishop in New Hampshire? What percentage would you say? Well, I'd say 80%. At least, 80 to 90%. Yeah, absolutely. And this leads us to one of the primary problems in coverage of religion in general, but especially with coverage of Anglicanism, which is that everything is about LGBTQ+, everything. Mm -hmm. And since the press's analogy is that's equal to racism, you're plunged directly into a one issue fight, which simply does not explain conflict in a global communion. Uh, Words like liberal and conservative don't do you a whole lot of good when you're trying to describe Africa and Asia and the global South. And I'm a huge fan of the Jenkins book of the first Christendom. Um, And or was that the headline on the piece he wrote at the Atlantic? But you know what I'm talking about. He basically came out with the thesis that the future of Christianity was essentially in the global South in Anglicanism and uh, I would argue Roman Catholicism, and certainly in Methodism, with Africa and Asia growing while the churches of the frozen chosen in Europe and North America seem to be in decline. I, I think the single most important Anglican anecdote that I have included in my coverage, and I've used it a lot at Get Religion, but I got it in the column as well, comes from um, the venerable Bishop uh, C. Fitzsimons Allison. And he was talking about one of those kumbaya meetings that they were trying to have to try to calm things down at a Lambeth conference. And the, the bishops from America and Europe were, things are positive, things are looking fine, things are getting better. You just have, we just need to learn to love each other and accept our differences and essentially arguing for what I call theology by zip code. Or um, in an essay I wrote for Doug LeBlanc years ago, location, location, location. The most important thing in Anglicanism is what is your zip code? You know, and and what is your, what is the current identification of your bishop? But anyway, uh, Fitzsimon said that after a while, an African bishop grew very frustrated with this talk. And he leaned forward and he looked at the American bishop and said, where are your converts? Where are your children? And where are your priests? Hmm. And there was a long silence. And I would argue that that's actually a very good template for accurate coverage of battles within Methodism, Anglicanism, and increasingly the Church of Rome. I mean, in that you look at the health of the Roman Catholic Church in Africa, 
and compare it with, let's say, Germany or Europe. And where are your converts? Where are your children? Mm -hmm. Where are your priests? Those are highly relevant questions. Yeah. Especially when you consider... Go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, Africa and the Global South is night and day compared to, to the West here. Well, if journalists really want to look at the state of the churches that are involved in this kind of theological Mm -hmm. zip code warfare. I think the crucial statistics now are not just memberships, as important as that is. And that Anglican bishop, by citing children, where are your converts, where are your children? I think the crucial statistics that people need to be watching right now are marriages and baptisms. And that's baptisms of converts, but also baptisms of children. I have seen some absolutely astonishing astonishing statistics out of some Episcopal dioceses in America related to baptisms, marriages, etc. I mean, there, and then you have, of course, you have Sunday morning attendance, mm-hmm. where you have an, an entire diocese with lower Sunday morning attendance than, say, one average Baptist church you know, in a state like Texas or something like that, or even one pretty good Episcopal megachurch in a state like Texas. Um, So we have to think of life in a church. We have to broaden our concepts a little. That membership number is important. But if you really want to test it, look at marriage, look at baptisms, and look at who's producing priests. This is especially true in Roman Catholicism right now. If the big story, other than clergy sexual abuse, if the big overarching story in the Roman Catholic Church over the last four decades has been the declining number of priests, we have to ask why that is. And sometimes if you talk to people on the Catholic left as well as the right, they will admit that a a plummeting birth rate among American Catholics, has a lot to do with the priest shortage. And so then you ask, well, why is that? And to some degree, Catholics are evolving into pretty normal suburban Americans. Mm -hmm. And that's a question for people on both sides of the divides in Catholicism, Methodism, Anglicanism, etc. To what degree is your parish genuinely countercultural? And I think that quote from the Anglican bishop care of Fitzsimons Allison, I think that's a that's a really interesting trio of issues to think about. Who's producing priests, who's producing converts, and who's producing children? Who has marriages and children? And the United States, of course, much like South Korea and Italy and several others, is in a crisis of marriage formation. And that's a Basically, that's a religious issue, because if you find people who are married and have growing families, 95% of the time that people are going to be doing that for a religious reason. Something else has changed over the last uh, generation. What happened to all the local religion reporters? Well, I mean, journalism is in a period of advertising collapse. Mm -hmm. I I wrote an essay recently for the Acton Institute for their Religion and Liberty Journal called The Evolving Religion of Journalism. And in it, I noted that the American model of the press, where you're supposed to try to treat people on both sides of an issue fairly, with respect, with accuracy, that's dying right now if it's not totally dead. And it's dying for business reasons as much as political. Mm -hmm. If you only survive by having people who are willing to pay you money for your content, you had better keep those people happy who are writing the checks. And in a world in which people are increasingly living in their own concrete digital silos of information where they only listen to people they want to listen to, actual, fair, accurate, balanced, non-biased news is bad business. If the four powers of big tech control 80 to 90% of the advertising, 
you're down to the dollars people send you. Mm-hmm. And at the New York Times and, and other places like that, they're giving their readers what they want. Of course, this happens with conservatives as well. I mean, it's, it, to some degree, it's Fox News versus MSNBC, you know, in terms of those those business models. But I, I think that's tragic. To some degree, we've gone back to an old, older model of journalism that was in Europe in like the 18th and 19th century, which is where publications are openly biased and openly confess their views. In America, we're kind of in transition right now. We have people who are still claiming to be doing fair-minded, accurate, you know. Um, we report, you decide. Issues. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. report, you decide. Yeah. But they're not really being honest about what their what the makeup of their newsroom is. This is why the recent National Public Radio fight with Harry Berliner was so important, which was he was he you know he was a liberal's liberal, and what he was saying is that National Public Radio has moved past liberalism, Mm -hmm. which is into a state that I would say is illiberal and, quite frankly, doctrinaire. Um, And you used a word earlier that I would challenge somewhat. I don't think we're in an age of secularism right now, as much as we're in an age where the press has decided there's good religion and there's bad religion. And they love good religion. And frequently, good religion, in the view of the press, looks like the leadership of the Episcopal Church. Uh, oh, sorry, and yeah. bad religion. And absolutely. I mean, if you got a job as a, a priest for, a, a, and you're a columnist in the New York Times, they know you don't have the ability to convert anybody, but you can talk in very fluffy ideas. Well, and you photograph well. You photograph well. Uh, it's, I, I've always argued that one of the reasons... Episcopalians are so popular with the press, besides the fact that in every newsroom I've ever worked in, there were large numbers of Episcopalians and Mm ex-Catholics. But when you have a photo on, oh, you need an advanced photo for Easter. The Episcopalians look like Catholics, but act like journalists. Mm -hmm. And that's the perfect religion. That's the that photographs. Well, I mean, who wants to take pictures of Southern Baptist in three piece wool blend suits, right? I mean, they look religious, and that's what you want, right? Mm-hmm. And so, to some degree, coverage of the Episcopal Church has always way way out balanced its its reality in the world. Its influence, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's not just Episcopalians who are presidents or in Congress or whatever. Episcopalians own crucial real estate in the middle of every blue political cultural zip code in America. And they're there. They're ready to be photographed. They're ready with a a hip, trendy statement on every possible issue from the the morality of styrofoam cups to pronouns, you know, and, and everything in between. So the Episcopalians have received lots and lots and lots of coverage. And this brings us back to that thing that I was calling the Anglican timeline. I have a version of it here from late in the life of Get Religion that I think I can call up on my screen without damaging your camera. I think that probably made... You can do it. Yeah, that made the the lighting on my glasses a little bit funny there for a second. You could probably even read it. But in, in Anglican timeline disease, My timeline begins with Bishop John Spong publicly ordaining the first non-celibate openly practicing homosexual in 1989. Now, of course, before that, you had battles over the ordination of women. Mm -hmm. You had a very, very important battle over the makeup of the prayer book. And that was one that didn't break down strictly by left and right, but it certainly pointed towards some important issues. Um, a lot of evangelicals didn't mind the new prayer book, but it just kept evolving. I mean, so that the worship wars came to it. I am. Um, let's see. I think a key issue that should be in most timelines, because Bishop Spong died as a bishop in the Episcopal Church, I think 1994 and the publication of the 12 Theses by Spong. 
which was basically not even theism. I mean, he was arguing directly against a God with whom you could have any kind of transcendent relationship. I thought it was and just any a, kind of... It was an example of the best fallacies you can use in an argument. But okay. <laughs> yeah, but, don't, I think, but I think the fact that he remained a bishop in the church yeah. makes that terribly important. And that brings us back to Fitzsimons Allison and something that he attempted to do and there, there were two moments in the House of Bishops that I think should be in timelines. One is the Fry Amendment, F-R-E-Y, Bishop Fry, mm -hmm. who attempted to have the House of Bishops vote. He wanted a voice, voice vote so we could see who was yay and who was nay. And the, the Fry Amendment was simply, Episcopal clergy will not have sex outside of marriage. I think that's the exact wording. And, of course, it was tabled, and Bishop Fry was not able to get a vote, a vote on that by name, I believe. Well, Fitzsimons went even further, and I played some role in this because I publicized something that happened. I wrote an essay for Doug LeBlanc um, in one of the Anglican publications called Liturgical Dances with Wolves, and it was a description of kind of where I was after 10 years in the Episcopal Church. And part of it was a liturgy, quotes from a liturgy at Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City on for their Gaia Mass. Mm -hmm. And the preacher was Carl Sagan, and the Sanctus was sung by a humpback whale, and they had wolf cries and all of this other stuff going on. And I saw the minister's communing dogs who came forward to receive communion. And it was wild. And it was the 10th anniversary of the day my wife and I joined a catechumen class to become Episcopalian. And as I put it in that article, I, um, I didn't go forward to receive communion because I was not sure what I would be receiving. And I had a conversation with Fitzsimons Allison soon after that and sent him a copy of the worship leaflet. And it led to Fitzsimons' attempt to get the House of Bishops to vote on a simple, direct uh, proposition, which is Anglican clergy will not worship gods, other gods by name at their altars, based on the fact that in that service they sang praise to river gods and pagan gods of Africa, um, Yah and the Ra and Ashra were, were named mm -hmm. in the service in hymns. And that Simon thought that was a, um, a pr another pretty clear line. We're not going to worship other gods by name. And when they refused to vote on it, that Simon's decided not to receive communion in the house of bishops and never did again, mm -hmm. as far as I know. And I would argue that that's a pretty symbolic moment. Um, it's the symbolic moment of kind of the nature of an Episcopalian bishop. I wouldn't do that, but I wouldn't try and stop somebody else from doing that. And, you know, we saw that in the 80s and 90s where, oh, you know, of course it's wrong. We would, oh, absolutely, but, I, you know, I'm not going to vote to kick out Bishop Spong or, uh, you know, anything like that, because, you know, that's them over there. That's not my diocese. It'll never affect this diocese. And what happens in a, in a decade and half a generation? Your, di your diocese is dead. And that's the location, location, location mm -hmm. situation. And what I think was particularly interesting about that is that Bishop Allison is the epitome of a black Catholic reformed low church Anglican. And yet, to some degree, the Anglo-Catholic portion of the Anglican Communion has waved a white flag way before the charismatic and evangelical parts of the Communion have. And I don't think most reporters have any idea why that's important. And what it also states about the differences between the church in Canterbury and Africa, you know, um, the, you know, and I'm, so what I'm saying here is theology actually matters in news. And I think 
most reporters think religion matters to the degree that it affects politics because politics is real and religion is not so real and you can't use that formula and cover a global communion it just doesn't work well it doesn't work but i you know talked earlier about the lack of religion reporters I think the lack of educated reporters or, you know, reporters now that can actually write uh, stories that have both sides of an issue is gone. You know, I, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, that assumes you read both sides of the issues Mm -hmm. and that assumes, you know, anyone on both sides of the issues. And that also assumes that you at least respect them on both sides of the issues. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to report unto others as you would want them to report unto you, mm-hmm. as a way I used to put it to my journalism students. And that's the old American model of the press. But that doesn't make business sense in an age in which Twitter, as very wise, the leader of the free press, I put it, before, of course, the, the man who must not be named, Elon Musk, bought Twitter she said Twitter is not on the masthead of the New York Times, but it's one of the editors of the New York Times. Sure, absolutely. That they are responding to their audience via Twitter. And I don't know what social media platform has that clout now, but you know that it does. And and that's a that's a press model on the right as well as the left. I want to stress that. But because journalists because Christian believers, especially conservatives, distrusted journalism and even hated it. And I know that as someone who taught journalism in very conservative Christian settings. The cultural left holds all of the journalism high ground. If you were looking at what I consider the two most influential media institutions in the world, I would say that's the New York Times and the BBC. Correct. Absolutely. And if you look at their religion coverage, I think they're very pro-religion when that religion agrees with them. They're pro, they are pro-rainbow religion. If, if you're that religion flies, that's a religion. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And so if if your denomination flies that rainbow flag, you're going to get very uh, flowing coverage. Uh, for, you know, for whatever you do, you can you can do no wrong. Mm. If you <clears throat> challenge that uh, the queer community uh, and the rainbow flag, uh, oh. you, you are you are Satan himself. But see, one there, you just I think that there are reporters who would applaud what you just said. Yeah, I hope so. In saying that it's only the LGBTQ issue, mm-hmm. Fitz Simons Allison was talking about the literal worship of other gods. That and, is, in my world, that's the that is the queer community that they're worshiping another well, god, where they themselves are the god. Well, I actually think they were naming pagan deities in that sure. in that guy. Uh, in that. Yeah, yeah. So this leads to something that originated actually during. This is another trope that we used at Get Religion frequently. It mm-hmm. became known as the T Mat Trio, and this was a series of questions that I developed during that presiding bishop race in the mid eighties. And I've used them ever since and have suggested them to reporters, not for partisan reasons. I said, but if you're covering battles within a Christian community, ask these three questions and you're not looking for a particular answer as, as terms of news, as a journalism value. You want the information they use to either answer the question or to avoid asking, answering the questions. And the three questions in the TMAT trio are, one, did the resurrection actually happen as an event in real time? In other words, was it a historical event mm-hmm. or were they hallucinating, dreaming, you know, all the other theories from seminary life? Question number two is, is salvation through Jesus Christ alone? This is basically universalism versus traditional Christianity. 
And the third question and the wording of this, the late George Gallup told me that he loved this wording. <clears throat> he tried to get his pollsters to use it. The wording was, is sex outside of marriage a sin? Now, notice that that isn't a gay and lesbian issues. It is indirectly. Sure. But when Bill Fry was saying Episcopal clergy should not have sex outside of marriage, that affected a whole lot of people. That affected sexual affairs. That affected cohabitation. And he was not saying the worst of sins. He was not saying the unforgivable sin or the unhealable sin. He was saying none of that. He was just saying, is sex outside of marriage a sin? And if you ask those three questions, you're going to get some very interesting answers. I think it was Edmund Browning who, during one press conference, when I asked the trio, uh, who said, who kind of leaned forward and said, I just don't understand the purpose of these questions. Right. <laughs> and <clears throat> I would argue, yes, I can see. And he answered yes on resurrection. I heard some others waffle on that. Um, maybe not in the presiding bishop election, but but anyway, those three questions are the first two in particular are at the core of traditional Christianity, especially the resurrection. I mean, ask Saint Paul about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if without the resurrection, we are to be pitied, and. In terms of salvation, the late Pope St. John Paul II said he had a lot of trouble looking at the 20th century and deciding that hell was empty. I think was how he put it That's in one of it, his yeah. first books. Yeah. <clears throat> so people would say, well, Mattingly, that's just you as a conservative believer trying to impose your values on people. That has nothing to do with news. To which I argue, well, if you're attempting to understand why Anglicans in Africa are different than Anglicans in Canterbury, those are three good questions. And the answers people give or don't give will probably predict what happens. Diocese after diocese, seminary after seminary, closed cathedral after closed cathedral and other stories that we're seeing happen all around us right now. And those three questions are going to eventually, I would argue, help you understand where are your converts, where are your children, and where are your priests? Um, living faith versus demographically imploding faith. Um, I, I will totally stand by those three questions. Mm -hmm as uh, tools. So looking five and 10 years from now, what is the state of religion reporting? I mean, if it, it will, it just succumb to, you know, capitalism and, and the click and clickbait and bad, um, you know, bad headlines or what? Well, basically at the end of the piece I wrote for Acton, and again, the headline, if people want to find it was the evolving religion of journalism. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the journalism historian and con cultural conservative Marvin Alasky, and we talked about you're defined by who your readers are and who your paying customers are. But for the average person who wants to try, the few Americans or the few citizens who want to try to understand both sides and want to try to treat both sides of these arguments with respect, something that I certainly don't have to see happening in the U.S. Congress. Um, you're going to have to do it on your own. And I actually suggest that people use X as a guide and create a list of 20 people in public life on the cultural and theological and political left, as well as on the right. Find 20 people that you respect and that you believe they're fair-minded in the truest sense of the word, you believe they're liberal in the First Amendment sense of the word. And follow them and try to figure out what they're reading, who they're reading. Mm -hmm. And I have found that to be a good test 
Uh, one name on my list, for example, someone I've been following for 20 years because of his career as a First Amendment lawyer is David French, who used to be hated by the gay community because of his efforts to deliver to to defend the religious defend, liberty yeah. rights of conservatives and evangelicals and others. Mm-hmm. And now he's kind of the evangelical that the Trump world loves to hate for obvious reasons. He's now a New York Times conservative. But I still trust his views on um, what was the confetti that just went flying by? Did you well, see that? Yeah, I mean, you ha- are you using an Apple product? Yes, I am. Okay, so there's a new software update where uh, if you put quotes or you raise your hands, it thinks you're celebrating and put that out. Oh, so. Yeah. But, uh, see, I was using scare quotes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was using. <laughs> so if, you know, I, I have friends who use an iPhone every once in a while, and they'll make a strange gesture and the iPhone interprets that as, you know, oh, you're, 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 you you want to blow a horn or whatever. And or you have cry well, eyes, you know, it, it's so I'm doing exactly the opposite. Yeah. You know, in journalism, <clears throat> I'm using. The quotation marks that we now see journalists putting around the words religious liberty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As if religious liberty wasn't an actual First Amendment term mm-hmm. with decades of Supreme Court jurisprudence. Generations, behind it. yeah. Generations. I mean, mm-hmm. so, and something that used to be at the core of liberalism, mm-hmm. along with free speech, which raises another issue, which I ask people all the time What do words like liberal and conservative mean? in an age in which you're conservative if you defend free speech, freedom of association, and religious liberty, which used to be the core values of liberalism. Well, in the core values of liberalism, what was kind of respecting the protests that happened in the 70s, uh, in 60s on college campuses, and being completely disgusted by what's happened in 2024, on college campuses right well i would yeah i'm interested in whether people have applied for a uh, parade permit yeah. i mean the the, the could, classic have, case yeah. yeah the classic case that the um american civil liberties defended of the neo-nazis marching through a predominantly jewish suburb skokie yep was it skokie it was um i believe so and they defended them because they had a legal right for a parade. They had applied for a permit, and it was a legal form of public expression. And they defended their right to do that, even if it was intensely negative and provocative and offensive. Well, I don't think the American Civil Liberties Union would defend the rights of Southern Baptists to march through Skokie right now singing Just As I Am. Uh, in Britain, that would get you arrested for sure in certain sure, parts of absolutely. London. Yeah. And in Britain, we see people now being arrested for thought crimes in the truest sense of that word. I mean, the, the fact that a woman can stand on a public sidewalk across the street from an abortion facility totally silent and be arrested because of what she's thinking. And quite literally arrested because of who she is. Yeah, well, and, we we interviewed her on uh, Anglican Scripted, and yeah, yeah, it, it was just one of those. Yeah, I mean, I read these books in the eighties and and seventies, you know, and you're know, like, well, that'll never really happen. If it does happen, it will happen in the Soviet Union. It'll never happen in Europe, and certainly not here in America. And guess what? Yeah, yeah. So, what does the word liberal mean? That's an issue that we talked about a lot at Get mm-hmm. Religion. Sure. Because like it or not, we have to use labels in journalism. And I was stressing that journalists, I'm going to come back to your journalism question, I promise. I was suggesting that journalists need to quote people stating their beliefs more in place of liberals. When in doubt, let someone express their beliefs and quote them. And then if you quote people on both sides accurately and fairly, you have a debate about what those terms mean. I am a Muslim human rights activist. I ask him my question. How do you define, you know, can you call someone liberal if they're anti-free speech, anti-freedom of association and anti-religious liberty? What, what, what term do you use for people who fall into that camp now? 
And he said, I'm beginning to call them Jacobins. He said, taking that term out of the French Revolution. He said, because their primary belief is a hostility to traditional expressed public forms of religion, right. period, other than those that agree with them. So at the heart of journalism right now is, are you actually interested in the other half of the country other than the one that's following you at NPR, New York Times, Fox, Daily Wire? So in other words, are you actually interested in accurately reporting and understanding the views of the people you're debating? And I would say we're not right now. No, well, I would say as a journalist and as a person who monitors clicks and monitors income based on clicks, uh, they are more interested in the title and, you know, maybe the, the catch headline. But other than that, the content of the story don't really matter anymore because I am more desire that you click on the story. And I, I don't care if you're disappointed in the story. I got you to click on it. You know, and I, my income yeah. I, I, up to, you know, like a Daily Wire or a Fox News, you know, a good headline and a good catchphrase is worth eight, nine thousand dollars a day. You know, so what do we want to hope for in journalism? Hmm. I am I'm working right now with the St. Constantine College in Houston, and we're talking about creating a think tank on orthodoxy and culture. And that's orthodoxy with a large O. Mm -hmm. And we were saying, well, everyone's going to distrust us as conservative no matter what we do. So what should we do? And my point is to try to push people to URLs that take them to the actual documents themselves. And this is one of the things that was behind the creation of Get Religion was I loved the fact that at a blog, I could always link to the story I was critiquing and let people read it themselves. And we used large block quotes of original information mm -hmm. because we wanted people to read it and kind of make up their own mind. So I think that's the future of journalism. In other words, you give us your opinion, give us whatever, but when in doubt, point us to the actual documents. And that, I think that would work. For your my generation and, or our generation, we're kind of both the same generation here, it would work. But anybody 35 and under has lost that ability to pay attention that long, to read a full document, to care about an original document. This is the TikTok culture where they, their attention span okay. is 30 seconds to a minute, and they everything they want to know, they'll give you two minutes if it's good. But they don't have time I, in, their, in their life to, to follow to original document and, and try to understand that. Okay, that is the majority. I agree mm -hmm. with you. Okay. But then why is Jordan Peterson one of the most powerful two or three figures on YouTube with two hour lectures with a never ending stream of references to hard sources and documents? Oh, absolutely. There, there are some people who want it. And, at, you know, at my own parish, the people who have been walking in our door for the last four years, many of them walk in having read extensively. And these are young males. This is, and I would call them to some degree the anti-TikTok generation in the sense that they've been there and they've done that. And they're actively looking now for something that they believe will be foundational in their life. So I agree with you totally that... Well, you should always agree with the host. Good good, good, good show there, Joe. Good. Okay, okay, yeah. And, and yeah, you, you, you agree with them and then redefine part yes. of Yes. So I, I agree with what you're saying, mm. but I do believe that one of the niches in this media world will be trust us because we're going to give you the document. If you want to watch the entire speech, click here. Mm. And... What we're hoping is to create a center that journalists will turn to. Let me give you an example. I think I've written the only column about this. If you follow the press, Ukraine is uh, the government versus Russia. That's it. Mm -hmm. And lost in that is the historic Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which if you read the New York Times is the Moscow-dominated Ukrainian Orthodox Church. 
which has done everything it can under Orthodox canon law to separate itself from Moscow. Everything it can under the canons. Uh, okay, up yes. until about 10 years ago, yes. No. Well, okay, yes. Yeah, but okay. I'm saying right now, yeah. we're covering the present. Okay. It wasn't that controversial an issue 10 years ago. Right. Although the the there was a schism within the Ukrainian church. Mm-hmm. And there's controversial personalities involved in that, as frequently happens in systems. Mm-hmm. But my point is, on the ground, they are serving in the Ukrainian military. They're providing chaplains. The head of that church is a native of Western Ukraine. He's a native Ukrainian. On the like the day after the invasion, he accused Russia of the sin of of Cain of killing their brother. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's been very clear. Recently, their Council on Ecumenical Relationships did a detailed critique of the Russian world statement that came out of my, uh-oh, I did the quote things again. <laughs> Balloon, I'm gonna have to get, I'm gonna have to quit doing that. I'm gonna clutch my hand and try to force myself not to do it. But I use scare quotes a lot. The Russian world document is important, and I would argue that parts of it are heretical. As Rod Dreher has noted sure. as well, and many others. Yeah. But no, why is no one covering the fact that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has torn that Russian document to shreds on doctrinal and biblical reasons? I consider that pretty relevant in the current world of religion, but it doesn't fit the template. And thus, that statement doesn't exist, even though that document is easily found on the Internet. Mm. Why not cover that? Yes, it makes the story more complex. But yes, it explains why there are still millions of believers in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And even though their churches are being padlocked and attacked and whatever, and yes, Russia's attacking the, you know everybody. Evangelicals, everybody. I mean, this is not a defense of Russia. I believe the Russian invasion was criminal and sinful. Even if Putin gets to blame it on NATO expansion, he still didn't have the right to invade. You, you get my point there. I, so I'm sympathetic. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm sympathetic. I I have no sympathy for war because I've in my study of history and war it, it always ends in a quagmire. At some it point, does, they get stuck. It does, especially does when one side has more artillery shells and more yeah. soldiers. Yeah. But but anyway, so I don't want to. I'm bringing that up not to argue about Ukraine. Mm. I'm bringing that up to address your question concerning journalism. I'm hoping that there is somebody in the world interested in actual documents, actual speeches. And what people in Africa, Canterbury, and elsewhere are actually saying. And if you cover Anglicanism, Rome, Methodism, etc., through that lens, your stories are going to be very hard to edit. They're going to be very long. They're going to be very complex. And they're going to be almost as confused as the reality. But if you write them clearly, the readers will at least know what's actually being debated mm-hmm. and what matters. And that it's not just a gay bishop in New Hampshire. There's a lot of other dates on that timeline that matter. And yeah. life is complex and religion is even more complex. And we, there are reporters who know that and who do a good job with that. One of the big points of Get Religion is you can be mad at people on the religion beat, but most of the time, the professional religion reporters were doing a way better job than the people on the political desk when it comes to covering evangelicals and religion, et cetera. All right. So a long answer. That's fine. It was was a good answer. I hope I ended up. Yeah, you did. And before we ended the program, because uh, I have a meeting to attend in a a couple of minutes here, but um, let's, uh, let's be sure that the people who, are just introduced to Terry Maddenly here. I'm going to put in the show notes a link, a link to Get Religion in your uh, 
uh, script service. Well, Get Religion is closed. Get Religion is closed, but the archive is still there. Yeah, I, I, that's, we have improved it's the got search. A great engine. archive. Yeah, good. And if I mean, if you want to find lots of links, lots of speeches, lots of YouTube's, mm -hmm. go there. And we're going to keep it up, and we hope a university will adopt it for our reference desk materials. And then my new project is something that I think we would all agree is necessity. I've kind of gone on a flashback to my Denver seminary days, and I've started a substack called Rational Sheep, which is a phrase from the baptismal covenant, mm -hmm. we thy rational sheep. And it's about faith and family in the age of digital culture. And at the, the pinpoint of that spear, the point of that spear is the smartphone crisis right now. It's and yeah. and we have four very important books that have come out related to that. Abigail Schreier's Bad Therapy and Jonathan Haidt's uh, The Anxious Generation and Family Unfriendly by Tim Carey. I would suggest people look that up. But if you're interested in how the church works on that issue, please look up my Substack project, which is called Rational Sheep, or just search for Terry Mattingly. At uh, actually, I'll, I'll put out. it in the show notes. With it, you know, we, okay. Yeah, uh, you know, just so people, you know, have a place right at the bottom of the video here. Uh, first comment and show notes will have yep. Terry's information. And bother your bishops about this. Mm -hmm. Bother your pastor. I think every church that cares about children and family should have an annual event focusing on screen culture mm -hmm. and how you live your life in this era in ways that are both informed and sane and cautious. And I think this is church territory. I argued that at Denver Seminary in the early 90s, and we only had the internet was in the was ahead of us still at that point. The church never even learned to deal with cable television. We're not dealing very well with screens in everyone's pockets. And 40% of the youth young people having mental health issues, I believe in large part because of those screens. So I hope viewers will check that out because that's in whatever time God gives me, this is the issue, the beach I'm going to die on now. Well, um, that's interesting. To to about the church deal with it. God giving people time because as of March last month, you too was still touring here in Las Vegas at the sphere. Right. And they're still playing. Something you, you interviewed in, in the 80s. So uh, some I, things are timeless. <laughs> yeah, they have a shot at having a number one hit in five decades in a row or something like that. It's crazy. We'll, we'll see what happens with the next album. We shall see. Yeah, that was always, I, when I had the opportunity to play guitar, you know, trying to imitate the edge was always a dream. I'd hook up to all the electronics uh. and stuff and, you know, and do his reverb and uh, retiming. It was a lot of fun. But, Terry, I want to thank you for joining us for our program. We got to interview you and talk about religion in the news and uh, journalism. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I thank want you very to, much. Yep. Yeah, uh, any information we have, I'll put in the show notes. This has been episode, I think, 854 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>